Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Galecki. Welcome to the 474th Imagine Greater Buffalo program and the 96th virtual Imagine lecture hosted by our wonderful Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. We're so glad you could join us today. Uh, this program is created by the Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History, and Nature, or Cezanne, as I pronounce the acronym, and ImagineLifelongLearning.com. Now, before we get started, just a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted and your video turned off. If you have a question or comment, you can type it into the chat box and we'll go through them at the end of the presentation. We are recording this program so you can watch it again. Later on the Downtown Central Library's Facebook page uh, and their YouTube channels, and we hope you share the link with others. And thank you for supporting this program and sharing the information with others. Now on to our featured speaker, Terry Elford. Terry is the executive director of the Michigan Street African American Heritage Corridor. Uh, I'm sorry, African American Heritage Corridor Commission. Uh, under Elfert's leadership, the commission has seen immeasurable growth. With his guidance, the corridor has launched the process of to formulate a strategic action plan, develop new partnerships with community stakeholders, increased awareness on corridor issues, and united the anchors in ways that have never uh, before been accomplished. Prior to his current role, Terry Elford worked at Comprehensive Cancer Center's Office of Cancer Health Disparities Research as its Community Relations Coordinator. He is also active in several community groups, including Man Up, Friends of the Columbia, and Preservation Buffalo Niagara. Terry has a bachelor's degree in sociology from SUNY Buffalo State College and a MAOL from Madai College. So now let's hear from Terry and uh, what's going on with the Michigan Street uh, Corridor. Terry, take it away. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, again, thank you. Uh, for the invite and thank you all for uh, your attention today. I'm always very excited to come and uh, uh, talk about uh, our corridor and where we are with our vision, you know, uh, moving forward and things. So I'm gonna st start, hopefully you can all see this. This is, yep. uh, so um, uh, you already know about me, Dennis gave a great introduction, but uh, one thing I like to include with the introduction is the fact that uh, I consider this as ED, my, my, my dream job. I'm actually the first ever hire of this commission as, as this executive director. So up to now, I'm the best executive director that they've ever had. Uh, <laughs> and, and I won't be lying when I say that. Uh, I am a project of the community, namely of those historic neighborhoods that connect to this uh, heritage corridor. Growing up with other siblings uh, in my early years, uh, I... have uh, uh, remember the Michigan Street, Af the Michigan Street corridor, or Michigan Avenue, uh, as a vibrant community of businesses, uh, churches, entertainment uh, spaces, and 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 the like. Uh, that was uh, that sort of uh, equated to a very vibrant and productive community. Uh, so I'm uh, looking forward very much to sort of sharing with you all what we're doing. Before I go on, I want to sort of talk about what the commission is and who we are. This is our mission. So we serve as an advocate for the community, have been doing so since 2007. Uh, we, we like to say that we serve as the connector of the past, present, and the future for those historic communities and neighborhoods that connect to the corridor, uh, within the corridor, and beyond the corridor. We are considered the arterial of the African American community. This corridor uh, served that purpose over uh, over 180 years now. Uh, so uh, we take this uh, what 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 we are, who we are, very seriously. Uh, these are our core values, which guide our principles of our work. 
uh, and how we as commission operate. There are six uh, such principles, but the three primary ones that uh, that I like to focus on as an executive director, I've highlighted in red here, uh, ensuring that the corridor is recognized regionally, nationally, and internationally as a thriving, livable community. Uh, we strive to maintain the historic integrity of this corridor. And finally, we advocate for the interests of the individual farming cultural anchors within the corridor. And those uh, four anchors, uh, I'm sure many of, uh, many of you know uh, who and what they are. That includes in the middle here, if you can see my cursor, uh, the uh, historic Michigan Street Baptist Church, which serves as uh, one of the uh, last stations of the Underground Railroad in this area. It was a central meeting place for abolitionists and civil rights activists. Uh, lower left is the Edward Nash House, which, uh, which is located at 36 Nash Street, the former residence of the longest serving pastor, Reverend J. Edward Nash and his wife, Frances. Uh, their son, Jesse, uh, grew up in this home. He later became a, uh, uh, a professor at Canisius College. But this is where uh, Reverend Nash, uh, who was a prominent civil rights leader of the day in Buffalo, entertained such figures as W.E.B. Du Bois. It's between the church and the Baptist, it's between the church and the Nash House, where uh, the freedom, uh, the Niagara uh, movement was founded. And if you all know your history, that was the precursor to the NAACP. Uh, far right is the Colored Musicians Club, which, uh, op which uh, back in 1917, African-American musicians formed their uh, own union, which was the first, of the, one of the first, if not the first in the country, uh, namely because they weren't accepted as musicians in white unions. But the club became so much more. It became a social club, entertainment venue uh, that since 1934 has been frequented by many jazz greats that you all know, including such uh, greats as Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis. Billy Holiday, who incidentally met a drummer at the club and later married him, actually lived in Buffalo for a period of, of her life. Uh, and then finally, we also include upper left Waffle Radio, which uh, is kind of like the newbie in the community uh, or in this in this equation. Uh, uh, they were established in 1961 uh, by uh, and is now um, is uh, now owned by Sheila Brown, one of the few, if not one or two African-American women in the country that owns her own radio station. But uh, she st uh, started and developed uh, Black Radio History Collective uh, that sort of spans uh, six decades of urban music in our community. Now, a uh, little bit more about our commission. In 2007, it was supported by leaders in the local African-American community. Then New York State Assembly woman Crystal People Stoke sponsored state legislation legislation to designate the corridor as a historic space, and namely to protect the integrity of that space, especially around the four anchors that I just talked about. The legislation also established the initial structure of our commission, uh, which includes representation from uh, each of the anchors, along with numerous and other public and philanthropic organizations and uh, their representatives, both in voting and non-voting capacities. Uh, so just a brief history of the, about the corridor. I mentioned it's about 183 years uh, of African-American experience in the city of Buffalo. Uh, the Michigan Street African-American uh, Heritage Corridor is a nationally and internationally recognized Buffalo neighborhood that serves as the focal point of residents and visitors experience for learning about Buffalo's rich African-American history. Through its vibrant neighborhoods, shops, restaurants, unique structures, historical markers, people, and institutions, as well as a significant impact on local, national, and international history. Uh, the heritage area is a rich composition of locations across Buffalo and embodies themes of freedom, cultural expression, and self-determination, spanning time and transcending a uh, single geography. Uh, this time period, uh, the time period celebrated in our corridor includes the abolitionist movement, civil rights movement, and several uh, cultural and artistic renaissance periods, especially the jazz period. Uh, the Heritage Corridor's festivals, cultural events, and artistic programming draw residents, both national and international tourists, scholars, 
and artists, writers, storytellers, poets, dancers, and actors to this thriving community of historic uh, urban scale. Like so many other urban uh, African-American centers across the country, the corridor did fall victim to what's commonly termed urban renewal, beginning in the late 60s, right through the 1970s. Uh, so businesses, longstanding businesses, uh, uh, historical structures were basically raised uh, with promises of renewal, which was never realized in this community and so many other communities on the east side of Buffalo. So if you did an aerial view of, of our corridor, namely in this intersection that I'm gonna focus on today, uh, it, it's, it's, it's still, you can see the, see the uh, really the negative impact of the of urban renewal of, this, of, of, those, of those times. Uh, with proper planning and resources, there is opportunity to move to the next chapter of the Heritage Corridor by working together to take steps to ensure its assets best tell those stories of Buffalo's rich African-American history in a manner that would contribute to their collective longevity. And that's only seen through uh, what we hope to see co real community uh, revitalization. As part of New York State's overall effort to target revitalization in the region's most underserved neighborhoods, uh, $65 million in state funding from that billion dollar uh, Build Back Buffalo Fund uh, uh, was, uh, was carved out through Empire State Development and was dedicated to the, uh, focusing on the revitalization of Buffalo East Side to investments in nine target areas along four uh, historic corridors in the East Side, Michigan Avenue, Jefferson Avenue, Fillmore, and Bailey Avenues. And as you can see in the slide, some of the uh, more recognizable names that you see here were all part of that uh, an initial nine uh, target areas investment. The whole purpose of this, the whole idea of doing it this way was that, that if you can uh, turn around and transform these, what's commonly known as cultural anchors or anchors of a community, then that was for economic development, uh, revitalization for the rest of the corridor in these particular corridors. For Michigan Avenue, uh, uh, this included $7 million dedicated to the improvements within the investment area to un undertake and facilitate a unified, coordinated tourist destination. Empire, St Empire State Development continues to coordinate with the church, Nash House, and the club primarily uh, to use these dollars to address immediate cap needs for stabilization, renovation, and expansion. For these for those particular properties uh, the if you can see my cursor this is the vision of what will soon be waffle radio they are not receiving funding from uh, empire state development uh, however they are getting funding from the city of buffalo in transforming presently an old structure uh which is about 100 years old that's presently right next to the michigan street baptist church uh which at one time served as the uh, headquarters for the Chinese Business Association back in the early 1900s. Uh, they're transforming that space, and then the city plans on uh, building a sister structure, all uh, uh, in the look of the period of the 1900s, uh, that will uh, hold the Black Radio History Collective and serve as the new headquarters for Waffle Radio's uh, uh, operations. Uh, Michigan Street. Uh, just uh, the Michigan Street Baptist Church to the left, just uh, over the summer, focused uh, their intention on, attention on capital improvements uh, that address issues related to their roof and rafters, stabilizing that, as well as the foundation of the structure, which is close to 200 years old now. Uh, additional plans, uh, build out plans includes the addition of an annex that would be attached to the church, uh, but it will not compromise the church. It'll just be attached to the church. And in that space will be more restrooms and more uh, an elevator or a lift and uh, more uh, assets that enhances the visitor experience. Um, here on the bottom right is the uh, soon to be new uh, Color Musicians Club and Museum. 
they're planning on building a two-story uh, uh, inclusion or attachment to the old structure. And in that area would ho will hold classrooms, meeting space, uh, gathering space for, for celebrations and the like, uh, uh, as well as uh, space for young people who are looking to learn how to play an instrument. Um, so we're quite excited about what the uh, Color Magician Club is looking to ex in terms of their expansion. And following the Nash House, uh, over the last couple of summers, they've been finishing basic renovation work of their woodworking, uh, their doors, new windows, uh, painting. Uh, but they're also looking to expand the interior that would, again, uh, expand the experiences for visitors coming uh, to learn more about uh, Reverend Nash's home. Uh, we're also looking at uh, building another attachment to it that would allow for an elevator and uh, more room for exhibit space. To leverage and complement this effort, uh, private and philanthropic organizations created a, a pooled $8 million, what they, uh, what they call the Eastside Collaborative Fund. Uh, and out of that, Eastside Avenues was created. This is managed by the University of Buffalo Regional Institute, and uh, they strive to support operations, programs, capacity building, and community infrastructure associated with the, the five, with five of the state's capital initiatives, namely focusing on our corridor and our anchors, but also focusing on such uh, cultural assets like the Broadway Market and Central Terminal, Martin Luther King Park as well. So uh, most recently, President, uh, our present governor, Kathy Kokel, as part of her continued efforts to correct the ills of the past, uh, uh, as it applies to the east side of Buffalo, announced that she uh, would be investing an additional $30 million for capital improvement projects to enhance the Heritage Corridor as a destination for visitors from around the world, while preserving and protecting its heritage, cultural assets for the community, uh, for many generations to come. The intent of the strategic action plan effort was to facilitate a consensus building uh, and planning process among stakeholders, including our board of directors, uh, our staff, elected officials, uh, uh, as well as involved public agencies, key adjoining property owners, operators around our, our investment area. Now, when I say the investment area, it's primarily around the Michigan Broadway uh, intersection, if you, you know, there, namely near the south, southern tip of the corridor right now. Uh, that's where all of our anchors are located. Uh, and that's where we're really trying to enhance and complement this notion of destination heritage tourism as being the key economic engine to drive economic uh, change along the entire 3.5 miles of our corridor. Uh, and I, I, would, I wanna say with our strategic action plan, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of, of is that this plan is not the Terry Alford plan or the commission plan. Uh, this plan was gleaned by the community itself. Uh, in 2020, we hired uh, an agency, Moody Nolan, which is primarily uh, in New York City, uh, uh, African-American owned company. And we didn't hire them because they're African-American. We primarily hired them at the uh, national search because of their success in transforming, namely African-American communities across the country, transforming them into economic juggernauts, business districts, and that, that focus on, on, on history and heritage. Uh, and over the course of a year, Moody Nolan and their contractors, in, you know, even despite the challenges of the pandemic, uh, we uh, hosted a number of virtual meetings with different buckets of the community, which included uh, elders, uh, faith-based leaders, uh, block club leaders, uh, young people, youth, young professionals, uh, historians and teachers or educators. Uh, so uh, we uh, we also included focus groups and, and conversations with 
uh, our mayor, our council president, and the like. So over the course of a year, we created, based on the comments and feedback from, you know, from all these engagement sessions virtually, we created this plan. And one of the things that we found was there were a lot of things that validated. We already knew some things, but there was a lot of things that everyone, despite their ages or where they lived in this community, they all wanted the same things in terms of the vision, uh, in terms of where the where they like to see the, the corridor become and where they like to see it go. So uh, these are some of the things that that uh, that definitely came um, uh, up to that vision. These are the recommendations made by the community that uh, we develop a plan around. Uh, so some of the most immediate things that we're doing, you know, uh, we, we crunch it down in three different areas, you know, short, mid and long term goals uh, um, in terms of transforming this part of the corridor. And the most immediate activation goal that we're, we're focusing that we're focusing on uh, includes uh, such things as public works, streetscape improvements, uh, property acquisitions, uh, spatially redefining the corridor with storytelling, which is very important, uh, open space activation. Um, uh, and then the other things more long-term includes infill development and adaptive reuse. Uh, so we are already started the process of getting that moved along. Uh, in identifying methods to best coordinate activities of each of these assets and formulate a concept design and spending operating plan for the investment area to be financed with part of a pending New York State grant, our overall goal is uh, to use this planning effort to develop a uniformly agreed upon vision for telling the important stories of the corridor, achieving sustainable operations for the commission and further developing its assets to facilitate increased visitorship and additional future private investment along our corridor. Uh, what you see here is an aspirational slide. Uh, I showed you a slide, what we aerial slide of what our, our uh, this part of the corridor looks like today. But this is what we hope it become in the next you know, five to 10 years and, and beyond. And yeah, it's, it's an aspirational slide, but again, what, what you see here is emblematic of what the community wants to see. Uh, one of the things that we've immediately in our focus on based on what the community wants us to start focusing on is the need for a visitor hub that ties all the anchors together. Uh, that would include a, uh, a headquarters for our commission, uh, as well as a space that would allow for uh, an activated co corner or intersection that would include pop-ups uh, and other items. I'm sorry, got the phone call coming in here. Uh, with include pops ups, pop-ups that would uh, definitely um, uh, encourage economic development. We have plans of, of engaging uh, both women and minority-owned uh, burgeoning business owners and proprietors who want to set up shop in the corner. Uh, that complements the uh, the four anchors. Obviously, uh, the the anchors alone will not transform this community. You need we our goal is to try to make this 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 community a vibrant neighborhood that people want to you know not just visit but to stay in for the entire day. So with that, you need to provide them a lot of different things, which includes such things as um, as uh, uh, restaurants. Uh, more entertainment, uh, you know, uh, opportunities, more uh, arts and culture. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the community says they want more green space that would allow for them to enjoy the history and the heritage, you know, in serene, in a serene setting. Uh, so these are all kind of things that we're kind of like right now are uh, working with the city and the state to sort of start putting into action, at least the short term. and. You know, uh, I can, at this point, I'll stop there because I, I can continue for another two hours. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to stop there and uh, entertain any questions that uh, your guests have, Dennis. Um, 
There, we got you. Got our audio back. Terry, that was great. Uh, you know, this is the Imagine series, and it uh, does my heart good when I see somebody like yourself and your commission and all the people involved uh, imagining how you, how you look in five to ten years. Uh, uh, that that's really what the the purpose is. This is a platform to help, especially with the with the uh, YouTube addition uh, now. See the visuals, Absolutely. so we can go from there. So, folks, uh, uh, shoot uh, your questions in uh, in the chat box. Uh, I, I'm going to ask your commission, Terry. Uh, that first slide, uh, one of the first, showed the north-south routes, uh, Michigan, uh, Jefferson, uh, Fillmore, Bailey. Right. Uh, does your commission addressing all of them uh, under the banner of the Michigan Street heritage, or is just, or is that heritage just about Michigan Street? Yes. Uh, so it's our our. Um, you know, uh, those four corridors are all part of what's called Eastside Avenues, which is receiving capital funding from Empire State Development. Uh, so uh, the total in terms of capital funding is $65 million. Uh, and it so, sort of speaks to nine different specific capital improvement projects, three of which are in our corridor. So each of those corridors, their own separate corridor. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, I'm the executive director for Michigan Avenue, but Jefferson has its own uh, ED, as does uh, 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 Fillmore and Broadway, as does Bailey. Uh, the other three are primarily business districts. We're the only historic district out of the four. But we are, we are all, all operating separately. We all have our own separate board of directors and things that we answer to or speak to who helps um, uh, define and decide how we move with these capital improvement projects. Uh, so that's all under uh, Eastside Avenues, which is managed by and coordinated by the University of Buffalo Regional Institute. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's that bucket of dollars. That's the capital money. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another bucket of dollars, though, that is provided through uh, from uh, our, our philanthropic uh, partners which uh, many of which you know, the Ralph Wilson Foundation, OSHAI, uh, Community Foundation of Western New York, all the banks in the area, they basically all throw money in a kitty, uh, if you will, that, that sort of speaks to operations. So uh, that's what pays my salary and my staff salary, uh, but it, it, that's what pays the bills in terms of the, our overhead for our offices and things of that nature. But, they, but more importantly, what that, those dollars sort of speak to it speaks to providing capacity support to all these organizations. Uh, when our uh, when our specific commission started in 2007, uh, the members that were appointed on that commission were all appointed by some government entity, either someone from the governor's office, the mayor's office, Crystal People's office, or what have you. Uh, so, uh, but they didn't have funding like what we have now. That changed about 2018, 2019 uh, with, the, with the billion dollar fund, if you will. Um, and um, and it's, it's interesting you asked the question because, you know, in the advent of the horrific incident, the 514 shootings at Tops, um, it sort of magnified all the ills, the social ills that still is uh, really... Um, affecting, negatively affecting, the, especially the African-American community, but East Side communities in general, uh, you know, lack of food, uh, lack of opportunity, uh, lack of hope. Uh, uh, but we, through East Side Avenues, have been doing economic development for the last two, two to three years. It's just people don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, you know, to get us ready to that groups like ours were ready to start uh, spending responsibly this capital money, we had to build up our capacity. And, and the funders and UB in their uh, undying wisdom uh, thought all this stuff out and got us to the point where we're ready to start tackling multi-million dollar projects at this point, namely in capital. So Sorry. it's like a holistic uh, approach to 
community development, community revitalization. Uh, and that's what uh, should be expected. So it's good, good news. Well, let's see what we have. Melissa, any uh, questions we can deal with? Yes, we have multiple questions. Um, so good. let's start with this one. We may go a little over, by the way, uh, but I think this is most important and, uh, and, and we should spend the time doing it. So Absolutely. go ahead. I couldn't help but notice that Michigan Avenue is the only avenue east of Main Street that terminates at the waterfront. Are there any thoughts or actions being taken to leverage that connection? Absolutely, great question. So in one of my slides, I talked about uh, some of the things that the community said they wanted to see. And part of, one of the most important things when we started engaging the community, uh, as well as such uh, you know, government entities as uh, Butsy, Buffalo Urban Development Corporation, Embora, was uh, this uh, continued, uh, you know, uh, remarks about the fact that uh, we don't have enough placemaking or wayfinding that connects the waterfront and water, the water edge to quarters such as ours. Uh, uh, and there's a, I have to say, you know, when people come to Buffalo, they look at places to go with their family. It doesn't matter what color they are, where they're from, what the ethnicity is. We, our economic development strategy show that even despite the pandemic, people are coming to Buffalo to enjoy history and preservation. They're coming from as far away as, as Toronto, uh, you know, Ohio, the, uh, of course, Pennsylvania. Uh, so they're all looking for how to get to these corridors and there's no real effective wayfinding or placemaking that, uh, that will assist the visitor to, to getting them to us. So uh, we're presently working with the city and Buffalo Urban Development Corporation on uh, redoing the street all the way down to the water. Uh, and that, uh, and that's, that was part of some money that was carved out by Empire State Development, working in conjunction with the city uh, to at some point start thinking about redeveloping the streetscape, this curb appeal of Michigan Avenue specifically. Uh, they were, incidentally, we're supposed to, they were looking at starting this work last year, but they decided not to start it. Uh, in lieu of waiting for our plan to be completed and developed, which makes sense. So now we're at the, that phase in terms of short term, uh, uh, what we can start doing now. And we're going to be starting at the beginning of the new year, uh, having those discussions on how to effectively do that. There are some things that obviously we can't do immediately uh, because it's mostly infrastructure work, but there are things that we could do now, like place, uh, placemaking, wayfinding, which includes such things as those you know, street pole panners, you know, color signage along the corridor uh, from all points, to, you know, uh, 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 all directions, if you will. Uh, those are things that we're planning now. Go ahead, Melissa. Another question. Would you like to see a Niagara region-wide underground railroad tour, including Michigan Street, Niagara Falls Railroad Museum, and half a dozen key underground railroad sites along the Niagara River? Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually there's already a, an underground uh, railroad coalition or group of, of folks that do that. Uh, but to answer your, that question, I'm excited to say some of the things that I didn't talk about sort of focus on capital improvement and, and future bills. And, but we, we, uh, I have a dynamic program director, her name is Audrey Clark. And since she was actually the second hire for this commission, and uh, since coming on board, one of the things that we definitely focused on immediately was getting all these anchors, all four of them in our immediate vicinity to work together to be open uniformly and charging the charging same rates for, for, for individuals and families and students who are looking to visit. But the second thing we immediately went to work on was making, you know, connecting those dots. Uh, with our friends in Niagara Falls, our friends at Broderick Park. Uh, uh, there's other destination sites around uh, Buffalo that we're looking to connect to as well. Uh, uh, but our overall goal is to create a, a, a destination tour that would include all these sites going right into Niagara Falls and even across the water into Ontario. Uh, where Harriet Tubman actually settled 
her church is there, you know, uh, uh, it's crumbling. So we're all trying to save it. Uh, but there's all kinds of stories on the other side of the Niagara. Uh, and so I'm excited to tell your guests here that we are, we're, we're planning that. Uh, we're working with uh, touring companies now to create packages that sort of speak to those stories as well. Um, uh, it, when we, we start talking to other executive directors and directors of these programs, and they all scratch their heads like, this is like a no-brainer. It's not rocket science. These are things that we should be doing anyway to enhance the experience of not just the visitors, but the people that, that actually live here. They have these unique stories right up under their noses that they don't take advantage of, and that's not their fault. That's ours. We got to do a better job of marketing this history and and why this is great, you know, heritage, not just for Black folk, but for all of us. It's a it's it's uh it's it's a unique story that really speaks to you know the the region, if you will, and why we are relevant here. So that's a great question. Good. Melissa, others? So your strategic corridors right now run north and south. Do you envision an east-west connector? And should these corridors also have bike or pedestrian safety street redesigns? Yeah. So uh, all of our sister corridors, those are the conversations we're having right now as well. You know, I, I'm, I'm inherently impatient, so I like to see all these things happen tomorrow. Uh, but uh, obviously they can't. Everyone's at different places with their development and with their plans as well. Uh, but yeah, we we as uh, sister corridors, we, the EDs, we talk all the time about connecting, at least with our programming. I just had a conversation with the executive director uh, that represents the, the central terminal. And uh, she's in the midst of implementing her strategic action plan, which is very lofty. Uh, uh, but, you know, we are now talking about how we, enhance the stories that that sort of speak to the central terminal and one of those things includes you know uh, working with her to tell the story of the uh the southern migration african americans migrating from the south that did so uniquely through the railroad system okay and and uh how that was served as the launching pad for uh, african americans that eventually settled here for opportunities uh, especially in the mills, the steel mills, and and the those those other industrial uh, plants that offered opportunities that they, they didn't have in the south, uh, especially you know knowing that that they uh, with Jim Crow uh, that was really uh, you know uh, leaning on a lot of black folk at, uh, during those years they needed to get out of those things with their families in order to have opportunity. Uh, one of the other things that were we're working with other historic groups in these corridors include, if you're familiar with the uh, Green Book, the movie, The Green Book. Well, um, it wasn't just just for folks in the South, African-Americans traveling to the South, you know, that needed places to stay in and they needed to be off the roads because of sunset laws in some of these Southern towns. Um, it also included places up North as well, uh, especially folks who were looking a place to stay who didn't have the means to get into hotel rooms and things of that nature. Yeah. Melissa, how many just, more questions? Do you just have? a few more questions. Um, have you followed up on the idea of reestablishing the Olmstead Pocket Park, known as Bennett Park, which was 0.2 miles away from the corridor at Pine and Clinton? You know, that's very interesting. Whoever asked that question, I would ask them to contact me directly. Because the, the quick answer is no. <laughs> we haven't even talked about those type of things. And those are like the unique histories uh, that we need to be told and, 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 uh, and encouraged to pursue. Um, that's the great thing about community, because there, there's pockets of these histories that either we don't know, honestly, or are not familiar with, or we... Uh, you know, uh, are not paying attention to because we're paying attention to these larger picture items. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, we, you know, I talked about all these great things we want to do with the corridor and expanding these historic spaces, but uh, there's other groups uh, that represent uh, assets that don't even exist anymore, like this park that the caller talked about. Um, 
that includes uh, such entities as the Michigan Street YMCA. For some, it holds as much reverence as the Michigan, as the Michigan Street Baptist Church, as the launching pad for African American African Americans coming to the city look for opportunities. So, uh, if if whoever asked that question, please contact me at 716-322-1002. I'll be happy to talk to you about that. 716-322-1002. One zero zero two. I would also encourage everyone, uh, if you want to learn more about the plan that I presented, I just did kind of like broad stro strokes, or learn about more about the commission and these anchors, please feel free to go to our website, michigastreetbuffalo.org. It's all spelled out, michigastreetbuffalo.org. You can contact myself or Audrey or learn more about uh, what we're looking to try to do with our vision in this corridor. And you can actually even leave comments like the comment just made uh, so that we can follow up on that. I'm definitely interested in learning more about Bennett Park. And just the last question, how might Willard Park Courts as an internationally important historic site and significant place in Buffalo's history fit into your strategic plan? It, it definitely does. So again, uh, our mantra is we, the commission serves as the connector of the past, present, and future for uh, historic neighbors within and beyond the corridor. Uh, the corridor represents about five uh, historic neighborhoods uh, that uh, primarily focus on the African-American community. And that includes historic Willard Park. So uh, I probably sit on the uh, 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 Preservation Buffalo Niagara Board of Directors. Uh, I actually attended a, a couple block club meetings last night, which included Willard Park. I'm actually, uh, I, I'm a new homeowner with my wife. We just bought a new home right there near Willard Park, near that near that park over there. Okay, so we're right in the community. So to answer your question, yeah, these, these assets continue to be very important to our history and heritage. Just because it's not right on the corridor is nonetheless, we, it's very important to us because many of the people that worked, played, uh, uh, went to church on the corridor, lived in these communities. And those communities all have unique stories to tell. Right now, what we're presently, on, presently doing through Preservation Buffalo Niagara and a partnership with them is to, is to try to save those properties over there, uh, to uh, try to preserve them adequately uh, so that other generations uh, can enjoy them. Then, those, those spaces have unique stories. I think it was probably one of the first public housing in the community, but before it was that, it served as, uh, it was uh, a Catholic church and campus that was there uh, that served the black community back in the early 1900s. So yes, that's very, that still holds great importance to us. And we are partnered with that group as well as other groups that sort of focus on those histories that are forgotten. Well, I think uh, you alluded to May 14th events and uh, this community since that day, uh, tragically uh, uh, as it is, uh, uh, all we can do is respond the best we can going forward. Absolutely. And uh, that's what these programs to some degree yours. Uh, next week, we've got Reverend uh, Mark Blue, uh, uh, president of the uh, Buffalo chapter of the NAACP. Oh, that's great. That's great. Be our speaker. And uh, what I'm going to try to do is look at the month of March next year and focus on some of the, the areas you're pointing to. Uh, so uh, we'll be in communication. Let's find out, uh, talk to UB, uh, who oversees the five uh, uh, north-south uh, avenues, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, for economic development purposes. Uh, let's, let's get an overview of the program of the east side. Uh, how do we take our connector streets that go east-west and, and uh, connect downtown with, uh, uh, with all, all of those economic development areas and the particular uh, uh, highlights of each one of them? Each one mm -hmm. has some, something like you're working with the corner right. of Broadway and Michigan, basically, mm -hmm. is, your, is your focus. So plenty to do, and we'll use the Imagine program here at the library to to at least create a platform for ongoing discussion. How's that? Oh, that'd be great. It'd be great to continue to update 
this group, especially in, in terms of our progress, but I would definitely strongly suggest I could connect you to Laura Cabral, who's the director of the University of Buffalo Regional Institute that uh, also supervises the East Side Avenues initiative. And she could really give you a great oversight on how they're helping to transform all those other corridors that I mentioned into economic um, juggernauts as well, uh, using a holistic approach, if you will. Uh, so I think that would definitely, I think your listeners would definitely benefit from hearing that too. Well, hopefully it would be uh, of, of, of service. I'll also close by mentioning uh, and encourage people uh, uh, interested, you have on your website, uh, roughly a 58 minute, uh, um, video to get it started, yep. uh, which covers your strategic plan initiative as it was unveiled back in February of this year. And uh, 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 comments by the mayor and uh, as a preface uh, and, and yourself. So uh, there's, there's good content being developed. I hope this is viewed as uh, a continuation of that, yes. of, that yes. um, of that program. Absolutely. So, uh, let's uh, let's move on. As I mentioned, folks, thanks for joining us uh, today, and uh, uh, we hope you'll come back next week and hear uh, Reverend Mark Blue, uh, President uh, uh, of the Buffalo uh, NAACP chapter, uh, and we'll see how that uh, the formation of that, which uh, historically uh, we can trace back to right here in Buffalo, the very area we're talking about uh, uh, preceded the creation of that, uh, I think in 1905, as I recall. So uh, I'm Dennis Galecki. Uh, good day and be well. <laughs>